the heavy dose of glutamine. So I think we can start from a run for this uh, uh, lecture, and it's, uh, it will uh, be a good uh, complement for what is coming in the third uh, part of my uh, of my lecture. Um, first of all, I wanted to say that um, the title you see is coming from a, a, a long or a longer study that I wrote in French and another one in Arabic. So I have two main challenges here. The first one is to give you an idea about this whole study in 45 minutes. And the, there are three parts. There's the historical part, uh, and then there is the contemporary uh, renewal, and then there is the, the, there are the solutions that we, we, we propose, or the, the, the challenges that uh, are there in the science of Solfaq. And the second ch challenge is to do all this in English. Uh, so I'll, I'll try to do my best anyway. So like you, like you see the, the title, uh, I said um, benefiting from the text of Revelation and I didn't say understanding the text of Revelation because the methodology is not only there to understand the re Revelation because understanding the Revelation is one step. But the Revelation came uh, to change the world, to change human behavior and to change human societies for the better. So there is also the application uh, and there is also the construction of the human being and the, and the society. So this is why I said uh, benefiting. So um, we will start with some uh, introduction. Uh, the definition of fiqh and usul al fiqh. When we talk about methodology, uh, we are talking about uh, one main science that were, was developed by the Muslims as a methodology to understand the text and to uh, implement uh, the revelation. So, um, this science of usul fiqh, uh, usul is the evidence, the deal. And also the principles of qawaid, qaida. And fiqh is like, in, in, in the linguistical um, meaning, is the fahm, the understanding, the deep understanding of things, the fiqh. And in the technical definition, the scholars um, defines the fiqh as the knowledge of Islamic practical pre prescriptions acquired through their specific evidence. Um, so, we see that, and, and then the usul uh, al-fiqh are, so they are the, 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 the evidence and the principles uh, which allows us to come to the fiqh, to come to the, the knowledge of the Islamic practical prescriptions acquired, acquired through their specific uh, evidence. This um, definition is the uh, definition that was accept, accept, accepted by most of the scholars in the beginning. Um, in the first period, there was no distinct uh, difference between fiqh and the other sciences. Fiqh was used to define, like Abu Hanifa said, fiqh hiya ma'rifatun nafsi ma laha wa ma'aliha. Is that one knows what is his due and what is his uh, uh, what is his obligation and, and what is his right. So that means that the first generations didn't make a difference between. Uh, there was no difference between the Islamic sciences. There was no difference between al aqidah and 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 al fiqh and uh, al tazkiyah, etc. So all of this, the fiqh was was something to define all the Islamic sciences. And then there was a distinction that was made, and fiqh was specifically used to um, define the practical aspect of Islam. So. For the Sharia are the text of revelation. Uh, this is the way that can get you to the deen. Like uh, Dr. Tarek said before, the verse, ثُمَّ جَعَلْنَاكَ عَلَى شَرِيعَةٍ مِنَ الْأَمْرِ فَاتَّبِعْهَا So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, we, we placed you on a Sharia. It's a way مِنَ الْأَمْرِ to that bring you to the Amr. And uh, like al Mufassirun says, Al-Amr هو الدين. It's the is the perfect religion. So this is a way that leads you to the source, leads you to come back to your real humanity, to the perfection. 
and and so this is this is the way. And the, this way is composed of three things: the iman, what Islam, what ihsan. These are the three components of the Sharia that uh, that can lead you to the uh, to the source, that can lead you to the uh, uh, back to to your real uh, human nature. Uh, so iman is the belief. So it's uh, it's uh, uh, the, the, the the things that you have to um, do with your intelligence, and Islam are the things that you do with your with your with your body, with your actions, and Ihsan that is actually um, like the Prophet ﷺ says, and another version, So the Ihsan is um, to act like you see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So it's the spiritual dimension. Actually, it's the connection between Iman and Islam. Because Iman is your um, intellectual conviction. And, and to translate this intellectual conviction into action, you need <coughs> Ihsan. And uh, because it, this is the engine that will make you uh, make sure that you will be faithful to what you know with your, with your intelligence. Because often we know things with our intelligence, but we don't practice them because there are things that, uh, um, that stop us from, from practicing them. So this is the part of spirituality. So these this are the three components that leads to a deen. Now here, the methodology of approaching these this three components will be different. Uh, so we have the Sharia that is the divine perfection, uh, and that, that is composed of three kinds of texts: the text regarding faith, the text regarding actions, and the text regarding spirituality. Now, to understand this text, we need a human effort in understanding. We need ishtihad. So that means that from the from this text that represents the, the divine perfection to the human understanding, there is a step. And this step makes uh, um, um, or takes away from the uh, um, uh, sacrality. I don't know if this, this is the right term in English. Sacredness. Sacredness. The good path. <laughs> so, so there is there is a there is a step here. So, from the text regarding faith, through the, the understanding of the text, the, the Muslims came up with the science that is laqida. And from the text that regards actions, through, uh, uh, through the methodology of, of understanding, the, the Muslims came up with the science that is fiqh. And the same thing with the text regarding spirituality. Now, the methodology of approaching the text regarding aqidah is slightly different than the methodology that is used to get fiqh. Because the text of al-aqidah, well, in my understanding, uh, the texts of al-aqidah are of two kinds. The first is, so in general, the texts of the aqidah are the texts that are immutable. Qat'i dalala wa thubut. Qat'i dalala wa thubut. This is a text regarding Aqidah. And there are two kinds of texts that are Qat'i Dalala wa Thubut. The first one is a text that speaks about the metaphysical world, the unseen, about Allah and the angels, etc. And the second kind is the text that are, in my view, part of the Aqidah that speaks about the seen world or about the human action. And th these are the texts that speaks about the things that are immutable in Islam, like the obligation of prayer, the, 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 the prohibition of alcohol and riba, etc. All of this is part, for me, of the aqidah because these are things that are immutable and things that you have to believe as a Muslim. As a Muslim, you have to believe that prayer is an obligation. So this is part of your aqidah. This is part of your worldview. So, so now, um, the methodology to approaching, for approaching the text that relates to the metaphysical world is different, is, is radically, we can say, different than the, than the methodology of, uh, of obtaining fiqh. Why? Because here we are talking about 
an unseen world. We are talking about a world that is not accessible to the intelligence. The intelligence is regulated by some rules and that are also present in, in the seen world, but the unseen world is really regulated by other rules. So trying to use your intelligence and your logic with, that is regulated by these rules that concerns the, the, the seen world to access to the unseen world is a, is a transgression. And this is why in the Aqidah, a lot of, uh, a lot of the groups went wrong when they use their intelligence to understand things from the unseen world, like Allah. And they use their logical to say, to, to, for example, to, to deny some sifat, some attributes of Allah. They say, actually Allah, um, for example, Allah doesn't, uh, doesn't come down, because there is a hadith that says Allah comes down in the, in the last part of the night, etc. They said, no, this, this is impossible. Because if Allah comes down, that means that He is in a space and that He fills a space and when He is moving, He is emptying another space. So this is impossible because Allah is not like His creation. So, so they use their logical to understanding Allah, but Allah is out of space. So how can you use your intelligence to describe something that is out of space and out of time and that is not part of this world? And, and, and so here the, 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 the approach, the methodology is uh, is different and the, the reason is not used in this unseen world. So here this is this is this is actually uh, uh, um, the Aqidah uh, uh, Salafiya that was criticizing some other groups that use their their, their, um, their uh, intelligence or logicals in, in, in Aqidah. But the problem of the contemporary Salafiya, they have this methodology in Aqidah which is fine but they transpose this methodology in the fiqh. And they use the same <coughs> literal understanding and they, they, they limited the intelligence in the, even in the fiqh. So they use the same methodology. And this is wrong because the fiqh is not talking about the physical world. It's not talking about the world where the rules of logics are not applicable. Fiqh is talking about a world where the rules of intelligence are applicable, where we have to use logics and where we have to use uh, uh, intelligence because it's talking about the human behavior and it's talking about uh, the physical world. So, so this is a, a difference in, in the methodology of Aqidah and methodology of Fiqh. Methodology of Tazkiyah also may be different because the Alm al Tazkiyah, so this is the science who uh, who handles with spirituality is, <coughs> and a big part of it is an experimental science. It means that it's ulama, ulama tasawf or ulama tazkiyah, with their experience in worshipping Allah and getting closer to Allah and purifying their soul, they write down their experience and they, they, guide, they give guidelines in this regard. So it's, it's a more an experimental uh, uh, approach and methodology. Um, so we, here we, we, will, we will treat about the, the fiqh, about the methodology of the fiqh, the methodology of understanding and practicing and realizing um, the divine will in the human action. So the, 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 the purpose of this methodology is to get the human action as close as possible to the divine will. Of course, the divine will, the Sharia, the Deen is, we can say, utopia. It's, it's, it's something that is uh, we, we cannot realize because it's the perfection. But, but the, the, the purpose is not to realize it, the purpose is to strive to get as close as possible to it. So the, this methodology will provide the rules and will provide the, the framework that will enable us to uh, um, to direct this human action as close as possible to the divine will. So here we can understand how fiqh, how important fiqh is, because fiqh uh, connects us to one of the three components of Islam. That, like we said, is, is the human action. It's Islam, 
and relates to the materialized and tangible outcomes of our mission on Earth. So, fiqh um, is the real realization, the materialization of aqidah, and <coughs> which is the framework, aqidah is the framework, our worldview, and fiqh is how we will materialize this, 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 this worldview uh, and is the practical outcome of, of this world. So, so it, it concerns all parts of human action. It concerns the human action. This is why one of, one of my critiques on, on, on the definitions of fiqh that we saw is that it limited or it uh, um, uh, restricts the fiqh to some parts of the human action and not to all the parts. Because fiqh is, is concerns all, it should concern all the human action. It should concern uh, the, so the, 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 the um, uh, this third, this second part which is Islam. So the accomplishment of the human mission on earth depends largely on fiqh, on how we understand this uh, part that concerns our action and how we apply it. So, like I said before, if the human came to Earth to to, to to realize some mission, and he needs his three components, all three of them. He needs a right aqidah, <coughs> a right view on the world, and he needs a right action. But he needs also an engine who will enable him to be faithful to his worldview, to be faithful to his. <coughs> Um, to his beliefs, and one can do without one of these three components. And fiqh is this material or this uh, uh, the realization of this component who, who concerns the human action. Now, the historical development of the science of usul fiqh. So, yeah, the science of usul fiqh is important because it's the science who gives the right methodology to understand and apply this Islam, this human action, this divine will in the human action. And so the usul is giving the guidance, is giving how should we understand how, our human, how the human action should be uh, and should be applied. Now, uh, the signs of usul fiqh I, I tried to categorize the historical developments in, I think, I have five, five phases, yes. The first phase, emergence and formation. It begins with the revelation and it's, it ends with the, the half uh, of the second century after Hijrah. So we have here first the prophetic period. When the Prophet came first in Medina, 13 years long, there was no, there were almost no practical prescription. Not, riba was not forbidden, and uh, 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 alcohol was not forbidden, etc. There were no practical, um, almost no, no practical aspects. There was uh, an, a focus on the aqidah and on spirituality and on the right understanding of things. So on the Iman especially, and on the Ahsan also. But no, the, the, the part of Islam, human practice was not um, a very, uh, a very apparent in that period, 13 years long. But then, when, when they immigrated to Medina, things were different. Why? Because the Islam didn't came just for the individual sake to purify the individual spiritually and to give them the right worldview. The purpose to have a right worldview and to have your soul purificated is not only your indi individual uh, sake, but also there is an, a social uh, um, uh, a so social part. The, the purpose is also to change the world, to be there for the others, and and to realize your mission on earth, because your mission is not only, so your mission is, like I see it, three things. First thing is to manage your inner self, your, to purify yourself, 
to get back to your fitra, to your real humanity. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَأَقِمْ وَجْهَكَ لِلدِّينِ حَنِيثًا فِتْرَةَ اللَّهِ الَّتِي فَطَرَ النَّاسَ عَلِيهَا لَا تَبْدِيرًا لِخَلْقِ اللَّهِ ذَلِكَ الدِّينُ الْقَيْمُ وَلَكِنَ أَكْثَرَ النَّاسِ لَا يَعْلِمُ So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, turn, turn your face to the, uh, uh, to the religion, religion of righteousness, and this is the fitra that Allah puts, have, have put in you. So this is your first mission. But it doesn't stop there. There is also the management of the human relations on all the levels, political and social, and economical, etc., on all the levels to manage the human relations. And the third <coughs> mission is to manage what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has gave you as uh, natural resources. So these three things are the, the mission that you have to do on earth, to manage all these three things as good as possible. And this is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, said that the human being is, an, is a khalifa. A khalifa which is an, uh, a, a manager or a uh, vice-gerent. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who, who, who manages everything. Is the one who manages everything, the whole creation. But he, 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 he left one part of this management to the responsibility of the human being. And this part of the management that Allah left to the responsibility of the human being are the three things that I mentioned. And if you see where the problem is in the world, it's in one, or it is in these three things. In the human being, he has problems inside of him, in the human society, and in the, our relationship with the nature. Why are the, 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 the problems there? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala left the responsibility of the management to the human being. Not because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, sometimes you hear, if there is a God, why is there so many problems, etc. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala left the responsibility to you. This is your mission. So this is, this is the mission of the human being. So this is why when Muslims went to, to Medina, things were different, and now we had um, practical prescriptions. Now we had, the, the human being had uh, social uh, social responsibilities, etc. Because, uh, like I said, the religion didn't came only for the sake of the individual uh, and the spiritual um, uh, reform, but also uh, there is also a social part, etc. So, um, in the in the prophetic period, Ishtihad was part of the revelation. That means that um, the prophets did Ishtihad. He did Ishtihad, meaning. And human effort to understand the text and to apply them. The Prophet did this, but still his ishtihad was a part of the re revelation. Why? Because even when the Prophet didn't come to a right answer or a right solution, the, 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 the revelation came to correct this. And this is what we see throughout the Quran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala comes and rectifies some things that the Prophet uh, did. Uh, and even the Sahaba, when, when they did ishtihad and they were wrong, the revelation came to rectify. And in, in an authentic hadith, uh, I think it's Abdullah ibn Umar, he was saying during the period of revelation, during, when the Prophet was alive, we, some things we didn't do them. We didn't do some things uh, with our spouses, for example, like being afraid that the revelation come and rectify it. They were scared because they, they knew that even when the Prophet didn't see him, the revelation is there. And, he, and they, if they did something wrong, the revelation was there to correct them. So he said we didn't do some things uh, because of, uh, they were aware of this. So even the Ishtihad and the Spirit was part of the revelation because the revelation came to assess and to, to accompany. Okay. To compare. Yeah. yeah, to go along with, with, uh, with this Ishtihad. So, yes. Uh, then the, the, I think I will skip a lot of things because I have a lot of points and I don't think the time will allow to go through everything. So uh, one important point here is that the attitude of the revelation toward the pre-Islamic society. When the, when the revelation came, it came, there was a society with culture and with uh, rules and etc. So the revelation didn't come to replace a society with the new society, which will be the Islamic society, this was not the attitude. But the attitude was to, um, um, to uh, um, accept 
and to um, yeah to accept what was not against Islamic principles, what was not against maqasid al-Sharia, the, the objectives of Islam. Uh, so there was five five different attitudes. The first attitude was to accept and leave like it is because it's not against Islam and it's going along with Islamic principles. The second, what was against the Islamic principles, the Islamic teachings and the objectives was if and it couldn't be it couldn't be uh, um, corrected, Islam changed it, changed it. And or, or it's Islam just uh, um, uh, stopped it and rejected it. Third, what was against the principle of Islam? I have an example for each one of these, but I don't think we will have uh, time enough to elaborate. Uh, uh, third, what was against the principles and the object or the objectives of Islam that could be corrected? Islam came and and made corrections, corrections and leave it, and left it like this, like Bayh uh, al one kind of transaction. And then the, the five, fifth was what, what was against the principle of Islam and couldn't be corrected, but it was a need in the society. Islam uh, um, rejected and came with an alternative on it. And I have examples also. And the fifth, what was not there in the pre-Islamic society and it was needed to achieve the goals of Islam, Islam came with the means to achieve these goals. Because the, the, the pre-Islamic society didn't have all the means in order to achieve all the objectives of Islam. So Islam came up with new means in order to achieve all the objectives of Islam in this new society. This was the attitude of revelation toward the pre-Islamic society. Then the, the period of companions, the companions they did ishtihad on sp sp spontaneously. Uh, they didn't need to have a, a methodology which was theorized and written down because they had a methodology. They did an ishtihad with a methodology, but this methodology uh, was practiced by them in a spontaneous way. So we have a lot of examples about the maslaha, about the illa. Um, the, 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 like I said, I can't go through everything. The, the companions consider it the new reality in applying uh, uh, the rules. Uh, one, one simple example is that uh, uh, when, when the, the Prophet <coughs> uh, conquered uh, uh, Khaybar um, uh, and other places, he he, as a as a salary, he gave some parts of the of the agriculture uh, uh, lands to the to the to the soldiers to the army. This is what the prophet did did in some cases. But in the period of Omar, uh, uh, um, he didn't do it because he said that if this was done, uh, there there are there are a lot of reasons that it's it's not um, uh, doable because the, the the soldiers will would be become landlords and, and rule their lands and not uh, being uh, busy with, with their uh, initial uh, tasks. And also, he said that the coming generation will not benefit for it because it would be in the hands of one small uh, 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 elite and the, the next generation will not benefit for it. So he came, uh, uh, he considered the new re reality in, in applying uh, uh, the rules. Uh, also, considera consideration of the new reality in finding al alternatives. This was also uh, part of it. You had the companions consideration of the new reality in creating the means. And like I said, I have example for all of this, but time will not allow. Uh, then we have the second phase, the phase of theorization and independence. Um, here in that in this phase, in this phase. We have the, 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 the schools of fiqh com, coming up and each and, and distinguish themselves from each other. And each school had now uh, a distinguished methodology in dealing with the text and in coming to uh, and creating or producing fiqh. And uh, they didn't, in the beginning, they didn't write their methodology down in, a, in, in separate manuals. But this methodology was applied and was clear, circumcised, 
and, and, and also uh, sometimes with the fiqh, they wrote down the methodology. With some principles, some prescription, they wrote down how they came to this prescription. But um, here the need came to theorize uh, and to establish the science of usul fiqh. So to, uh, to theorize these rules of usul, this methodology, to, to write it down. Why? Because uh, uh, different factors. One of the factors is that the Arabic language became, became to start weaker. So what the Arabic language is one of the main one of the main aspects in usul fiqh and the methodology of understanding the text. And in the period of the prophet, the period of the companions, it was not needed because they have they had still had a, a, a deep a deep knowledge of the Arabic and and, uh, and afterwards. With the expansion of Islam, with new non-Arabic uh, um, tribes and, and, and civilization uh, coming to Islam, there was a, the Arabic language becomes to start weak. And also, we had different schools of thought, but also different uh, sects and uh, that were trying to defend their doctrine. <laughs> they were trying to defend their doctrine. Uh, with playing with the text. So some become started to play with the text to establish they, their school of thought. There was also al in al-hadith. Some be, became, become to, or started to inventing hadith to defending their school of thought. So here there was a need to establish the rules of understanding to avoid misunderstanding of the text and to avoid also that some start to play with the text to adjust them to their uh, their doctrine or, or, or their school of thought. So here came uh, uh, the need of uh, founding or, or writing down the, the signs of Sul Fiqh. And the first one who wrote an, uh, an integral uh, manuscript on Sul Fiqh was a Shafi. Was, was he the first one to, was he the founder of the first one to write an usul fiqh? Uh, he, he wasn't one, the first one to write an usul fiqh, but he was the first one to write an, an, a manual that was uh, um, okay. comprehensive. comprehensive, yes, a comprehensive manual uh, on usul fiqh uh, uh, and, and, and uh, gathering what was the methodology of the, 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 the companions and the, the, the scholars in understanding in understanding the, the text. Now, Shafi, it was comprehensive in his time, but Shafi didn't treat all the questions of the soul. But he did. He focused especially on the needs in, in his time. He, his work came, didn't came out of nothing. It came out of a need. There was a need, and the problem, like I mentioned, was was a problem of Arabic was a problem of wada fil hadith and misunderstanding hadith and playing with the text. So he, this, was, this was his focus because this was the need. Some other things, some other parts of the soul, he didn't, he didn't um, elaborate them because it just it wasn't a need. And we will see maybe this, we will see this later if we have enough time. <laughs> the third phase is the evolution and, and development. Um, in this third phase of third and fourth century after Hijra, the beginning of the infiltration of rational science like uh, philosophy and uh, kalam and mantaq, uh, this is the, the phase where the sciences come uh, or started to infiltrate in, in usul fiqh for different reasons. Uh, also, in the second half of the fourth century, uh, the scholars of the four schools issued the fatwa stating the suspension of Ishtihad. Um, they, 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 they thought it was the Ishtihad that was done by, uh, by the four Imams before was enough. Um, so there were different reasons. One of the reasons is that they were scared of Ishtihad, and that Ishtihad became, becomes a mean of playing with the text, of, of changing Islam in the name of Ishtihad. This was one of the reasons. One of the reasons was also that there was a an ta'asub, an, a dogmatism towards the schools. Each one wanted to protect his school, his madhab, 
and was scared that with Ishtihad, his school will, school will disappear. Uh, and actually, this is the case. If Ishtihad would, would have continued, then the schools would have disappeared because the schools, in, not in all the parts, but in some parts, they are related to the time and to the period. So this was one, one, one reason also. Another reason was al qaba means that the, the, the judges the, 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 uh, and, and the, 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 the rulers needed a fiqh that was clear and without uh, uh, a lot of ikhtilaf to, to have a coherence in the qada, in the, in the, in the judgment, in the trials, etc. Because if there's so many ishtihads, we can't have like one can, can come to, to, the, to the judge and have a judgment and another one totally opposite judgment. So this is what's needed to have one madhab uh, which was followed. So, and, and also a lot of other reasons that you can find uh, in, the, in the books. Um, now, paradoxically, the suspension of Ishtihad had played a role, a major role in the evolution of Usul al -Fiqh. So, the, 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 the scholars called to stop Ishtihad, to stop this intellectual production of Fiqh, but it didn't stop in one time. There was no fatwas that stayed, stopped everything. Ishtihad continued in, in some uh, aspects. But uh, uh, the, the, the substantiation of Ishtihad played a big role in the development of Usul al-Fiqh. Why? Because the scholars, they find in Usul al-Fiqh, they find a way to exercise their intellectual um, intellectual uh, capacities and, 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 and they start to produce in the usul because in the usul there was not a problem. If you produce in the usul, you will, you will, you will not immediately question the fiqh. The fiqh will stay as it is, but they, they start to work uh, on usul. Uh, also in this third phase is the beginning of the break between the science of usul fiqh and its first objective, which is to adjust, adjust the human actions on all the levels as close as possible to divine will. Because now the purpose of a soul fiqh was not to produce the fiqh, because like I said, the fiqh, we, we couldn't touch the fiqh anymore, but the, 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 the purpose of a soul became, or, or was now, to uh, give credit to the, to the old fiqh that was produced, <coughs> to give more credit to come, uh, to enter into jideh and to um, debate with the other schools and to prove that the, our school is the right school. So this was one of the main objectives in this in the spirit of Azul. It was not anymore. It was not anymore used as a parameter or a barometer to measure fiqh, but to measure the opinions of the fuqaha and, and to, to, to not to measure them, but to, to assert them. The fourth phase, the phase of completion and, uh, uh, and settlement in the fifth century, this was the golden period of Usul al uh, Because now all the studies, well, the studies of Usul were comprehensive in different subjects, and there was a large scale production. And the, actually, the projection of the fifth century is now the main, the main sources that, is, that are used that will be used in all the other centuries until today are coming, especially from this period, from the fifth, fifth uh, century. And here, two different approaches in Usul appeared uh, um, in establishing the rules of Usul: Madrasat al-Mutakallimin or Madrasat al-Fuqaha, the school of theo theologians and the school of jurists, Fuqaha. This is what is developed by, by um, uh, by uh, Khaldun is in his Muqaddim. The fifth phase, inertia and imitation. After the fifth century after Hijra, the development of the science of soul fiqh stopped, and now the scholars will not produce anymore. This is what this is the, what I'm saying now is a general rule. Of course, there are exceptions, but the general rule is that the scholars will not produce any soul in this methodology of uh, understanding or producing fiqh but they will just imitate and reformulate or uh, um, summarize or comment what was produced before. 
Also in this period, there was uh, what we can say is that the advent of science of Maqasid and the role of the context in the usul was delayed. Now, we, we, we saw that what the companions and, and, and the prophet also who had a clear methodology, who was integrative, who, uh, who also take, took into account the reality and the objectives, this was, uh, Shafi started to write down this methodology. Uh, but like I said, he didn't write everything because he was responding to the needs and the, to the challenges of his era. But then the, 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 the science of a stool start to develop. And normally, logically, we would have had the whole science written down after a certain period. The, the, all of the aspects of the science, not only the way of understanding the text, but also the way of applying them on reality, also the way of considering reality, also the way of considering the objectives of the Sharia. But this was not the case. The Ilm al-Usul stopped, and it didn't, um, it, it was lacking some parts. And like uh, Abdullah Daraz and it says, he says, Ilm al-Usul stays, stayed a long period flying with one wing. And this is the wing of understanding the text. But there was not the wing of applying the text. This was not the wing of considering reality. Why? Because like I said, it's, it was detached from its objective since a very early time. Because the objective that was producing fiqh changed and, and it became mainly um, asserting what was produced. Uh, so this is why we didn't see Maqasid Sharia had developed in the beginning and we didn't see the role of reality. Then came Shatibi in the 8th uh, century and like Abdullah Daraz says, he, he balanced things again and he, he came up with this second way that was the role of the reality and the role of Maqasid. But this was in the 8th century, but this was in a period that was, there was immersive, there was no, actually Shatibi and other scholars like, <coughs> like Al-Fakhr al-Razi and Al-Amidi and Al-Izma and Salam al-Qarafi and Ibn al-Qayyim and Ibn Taymiyyah and Ibn Khaldun, all of these scholars were exceptions. And they were not, they were, actually they were strange in their time because they were in the time of Taqlid, in the time when there was very little production and they came up with this uh, innovative uh, production but it was an exception. So Shatibi, Shatibi also was an exception. And the proof is that nobody took Shatibi seriously and his work was not considered. And his work, his work of establishing the maqasid and the role of reality, etc., it stayed um, borrowed, no, it stayed um, hidden. Huh? Buried. Buried, yes. <laughs> Buried until the modern time. And actually, those who... He buried? <laughs> uh, those who, who, who re, re revived, those who revived his work were the modern, were the modern reformists. One of the first who paid attention to the work of Shatibi was Muhammad Abdu and his, his students, Rashid Rida and, and Abdullah Darraz, and, and then Sheikh Tahir ibn Ashur. They revived his work. His work was forgotten. Nobody yeah, uh, considered it uh, or gave importance to it, and it, it was revived in the modern times. So this, this shows you how uh, the, the period of, of inertia and, and imitation uh, uh, and, and the fact that Usul al stayed in this situation for a long time. Uh, now, after after this after this long centuries of uh, inattention and and, and inertia in intellectual production, the Muslims wake up in the modern era after centuries of inattention, and they, they found a terrible gap between contemporary reality. A new world order has emerged with new models, with new way of life, new sciences, new paradigms uh, in, 
from social, sociological level, political level, etc. And the Muslims wake up and they found this enormous gap between this new reality and their intellectual production. Uh, so they had, they had to fill this gap and they had to find solutions from their references in order to, in order to uh, 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 um, fill this gap uh, with, uh, with, with their, uh, with, uh, from their principles. So uh, the call for reform emerged and, and came in two forms. One form is Islamic, Islamist reformism, who wanted to stay faithful to the teaching of Islam and finding solutions to meet uh, the contemporary challenges, and the modernist reform, who was, uh, um, who was returning the cause of the failure to Islam itself, and, and who aspired uh, to an absolute imitation of the West. Uh, now, I have five minutes to uh, talk about the contemporary Reform and uh, <laughs> okay. so <laughs> so now um, so I will I will skip uh, I don't know what, what I will skip a bit anyhow so now let, let's talk about the the, the main needs in usul fiqh or in generally in the methodology that we need to develop for, a, for a, a good understanding and uh, application and, uh, uh, of, 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 of the scriptural sources and also the creation of new means to be faithful to the divine will in the, in the modern So, uh, in, my, in my view, we have Three, um, three main challenges. The, the first challenge in Usul al-Fiqh is the need of a methodology of application. Like I said, for a long time, Usul al-Fiqh, the methodology of approaching and benefiting for, from the scriptural revealed sources, was mainly focusing on how we should what is the how we should understand the text? What are the tools of a right understanding of the text to stay faithful to the divine will in our understanding? This was the main focus historically. So there is a lack of the second step is the application. How should I be faithful to the divine will when I'm applying this understanding? So here is the role of the reality. What is the reality? How should the, the reality play a role when I apply? Because it's not enough to have an understanding theoretically, but it's also important uh, because, like Shatibi says, the text are the text of Revelation are abstract, abstract. But the reality is not abstract, and there is there are a lot of specificities in the reality. So it's not possible for me to apply something that is abstract or something that is specific. So there is a second step that is needed here. And Shatibi called it al-ishtihad fi tahqiq al-manat. So Shatibi was the first one to develop this concept of tahqiq al-manat in this broad sense. But uh, um, after Shatibi, there is a lot of work that is needed to develop this methodology. Now, this work is, is being done, and we have several writings on this, but it's still lacking. This is the first uh, challenge. The second challenge is the, the need for a holistic and integrative methodology. Sorry, just picking up. You used an arbitrary Excuse me? Tahqiq al-manat. Tahqiq al-manat. Al-manat means literally what you hang something on, I mean, like uh, something you hang a cloth on, for example, al manat. And in, in the usul, it's the illa. It's the you know the pres Islamic prescriptions hangs on a reason. So when the reason is there, the prescription is there because it hangs on the, the reason. But when the raison d'être. The raison d'être. 
<laughs> so this is in Manat. This is in Manat. And Tahqiq al Manat is to see in the reality if this Manat is there, if I can apply this prescription and how I can apply it. So it is to, to look at the specificity of the reality to see if this prescription is appliable, how is it appliable, etc. Applic probably applicability App is, is good translation. Applicability, yeah. Applicability. Yes. So there are a lot of factors that can show me how appliable it is and, and, and how it should be uh, applied, etc. This is definitely uh, not. Now, now uh, another challenge is the need for a holistic and integrative methodology. Um, one of the main concerns of a Shatibi, and not only Shatibi actually, all the reformist scholars before him and after him, one of the main concerns was this um, fragmentation, like we've talked about it before. The fragmentation when dealing with the prescription and with the texts of Islam. It means that we take a text and we try to understand it, but without looking at the broader pictures, without looking at the maqasid, without looking at the reality, without looking at the aqidah, without looking at the other sciences that are related to the, to the specific issue. So all the reformist scholars try to handle this problem. And Shatibi, he, he, he tried to handle this problem <laughs> when uh, theorizing uh, uh, al, al So. And then, in the modern time, we had also all the modern uh, reformists who, who are dealing with this fragmentation also. For example, in the modern time, we have in tafsir, a science that is a tafsir mawdu'i, who try to, uh, to deal with the, the text when doing tafsir, not only with, with the verse, but with the whole context of the verse. This is one, one aspect of, of this global um, reform and methodology. But uh, concerning Usul al-Fiqh, one of the first, or the first modern reformists who tried to came with a holistic and integrative methodology in the modern time was Tahir ibn Ashur, who lived in the, in the 20th century. And he, he, he started from the same problem, this uh, fragmentation when dealing with the juz'iyat, when dealing with Islamic prescriptions and with Islamic texts. But he went farther, or he went further than the Shatibi. Because he was thinking that the, one of the problems of the fiqh, or of the ancient fiqh, is that it was dealing with individuals. And he, he, he suggested that we have to take into account the social aspect also. And so he came with his problem, he had a problem, Tahir ibn Ashur had a problem with, with usul al-fiqh. And he was thinking that usul al-fiqh the problem with the is only dealing with just yet, like I said, with the particular prescriptions and not dealing with the, the whole picture and not dealing and only dealing with individuals. So what he suggested is that he said that it's okay, we need this. We need to have a science to deal with particular cases and to uh, deduct prescription from the text, but it's not enough. So he said, let's leave a soul fit like it is and let's come up with a new science that will give us a broad methodology of dealing with uh, the text and with the reality. And he said, let's call it Maqas al-Sharia. And he said, this will give us, and he was thinking that this will give us a way to have this integrative and, 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 and holistic methodology. Because now this, this purposes of Sharia will allow us to produce social and political and economical paradigms so now we are not dealing with specific cases, but we are dealing with world vision in, in, the, in the different eras or areas of, of human action. The, the approach of Shatibi was different. Shatibi was, his, his solution was to develop the science of Usul al-Fiqh and to make it holistic, integrative. And no, I should know. He was saying that let's leave Usul al-Fiqh like it is. It was doing its job and let's come up with something uh, uh, parallel. I think I, I finished my five minutes. I, I had a little. Uh, okay, let's let's go for the third point and, and we That's conclude. The, the most important one. Yes, the need for a methodology. <laughs> the need for a methodology.
the need for a methodology that allows creative ishtihad. And, and I think this, this was one of the main concerns of Dr. Tariq in his book, Radical Reform. Now, when we talk about the first and second point, the need of a methodology of application, we see contemporary scholars who, did, who are busy with this. We see a whole center that was established by uh, Sheikh Abdullah bin Bayya for dealing with tahqiq al manat This is the first point. The second point, the holistic and integrative methodology, there is also a lot of concern uh, within the uh, um, uh, contemporary reformist with this point, we see the science of Maqasi Sharia taking a big part of, of interest uh, in the contemporary uh, uh, Muslim thought. But the second th point, or, or the third point, I don't think somebody, I don't know, in, in my reduced knowledge, has uh, uh, really uh, um, uh, um, stretched uh, uh, and focused on this third point. And I think this is a big problem, also and a big lack in the, in the contemporary challenges of the science of the soul and the methodology. This is a, a, a methodology that allows creative ishtihad. Because the ishtihad that we have right now, this human effort, is used to understand, which is good, is used to apply, which is good also. It's, so mainly it's used to assess the reality and to say whether it's uh, 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 whether it's going along with our principles, so it should be accepted, or whether it's against our principles, so it should be rejected. But there is no methodology that permits an ishtihad to come up with new solutions, to come up with new alternatives. So, for example, if we have if we have a reality and we say that this reality is against our principles, then we reject it. But it's not enough to reject. What is your methodology to come up from your principles with new solutions and with new alternatives on this reality that you are rejecting? If we are rejecting the global economy, for example, or, or if we are rejecting some things that are against our principles, what is your methodology to come up with new alternatives? I think this is th something that is lacking in the mother and the usul al in the methodology of, of uh, uh, benefiting from the text, and that is not stretched by any of the scholars. And this is the main concern of the Center for Islamic Legislation uh, and Ethics. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. challenge in itself to do all this in, uh, in 45 minutes. Uh, what I suggest, if you have two questions of clarification, we can take them and then we have all the other questions, keep them for this afternoon. <coughs> so if there are, if, are there two uh, questions that you want to ask by applying what was said before the break? Um, yes, go ahead. Why I know the soon stopped? Yeah. I said because since an early time, it <coughs> was disconnected by its uh, from its main objective. Uh, I, I said that the Ulm al-Usul existed as a practice. The Sahaba, they, they practiced the they practiced al-Usul, that, that is this methodology of understanding the text, of applying the text, of, of coming up with new solutions, of respecting the objectives, of Islam, and then started the process of writing down, theorizing this methodology. So what Shafi did is not coming up with new rules, it's he wrote down the rules that were already used by the companions, etc. But he didn't write everything down, I said, because he was, he was answering the challenge of his period. Uh, and, 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 and then the process continued after Shafi, but it stopped because the objective of Usul was not anymore to establish the rules of being faithful to the God divine will, but it started to become a means to, uh, 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 to support or to, how, how do you call it? To comfort. 
to support, uh, assert the, the, the fiqh of the, the, the old scholars. So it stopped, and they didn't write that here. The problem is the reality here, that the usul fiqh was not anymore a tool of producing fiqh. So they didn't need anymore to produce fiqh. So it was not needed to, to, to theorize how we should take into account the reality and the maqasid, etc. Because this would be needed if you need to produce a new fiqh to take into consideration the new reality. But this was not needed anymore because usul was not anymore a tool to produce fiqh, but only to assert the ancient fiqh. So it, this is why it stopped. It was not needed to go further than this. Thank you for the speech. Just you mentioned that Shantibi, he, he tried to make the Usul uh, Fuqa holistic and integrated. And then Fahid and Ashur come and say, just leave Usul Fuqa and come with an alternative. What the alternative he came up with? No, no, Ashur came with Maqasi Sharia. No. Yeah, he make it an alternative to the Usul? Not an alternative, something that is parallel. He, said, he didn't say that Usul Fuqa should be uh, rejected. No, Usul Fuqa is still useful, but it's useful and for deduction of the just But he, it was not useful to produce new thought, new paradigm socially. And when you read his book of Nidam uh, al it's clear he's coming up with a new paradigm on society with Maqas al Sharia. So, Usul al Fiqh is useful, but not for the purpose that he wanted to. And with the Shatibi, the difference also between Nuashur and Shatibi is that the Shatibi, um, he talked about usul, but he, uh, about maqasid, but he didn't come up with maqasid. He didn't come up with manduma maqasidiyya, which means um, a framework of maqasidiyya. He just talked about the theory, how we should understand maqasid, how we should uh, deduct maqasid from the text. This is what the Shatibi did, but he didn't come up with a maqasid theory or a maqasid uh, a framework. And Ibn Ashur, he did. He came up with a framework. He came up with Mandoma maqasidiyya in some parts, in mu'amalat and in ahkam usariyya, etc. This is the difference also. Yeah, what I understood that originally, like from the usul, like the usul of the fiqh is built on the maqasid of the sharia, yeah? Or didn't it? Should be, it should be. <laughs> so I can't like see like what what Taha bin Ashur trying, if it's a maqasid, it has to be like like when you have the usul, the usul should be built on the maqasid. This is what I understood. If I'm right. Yes, it should be. But the tra traditional usul fiqh, it it was a it, it, look only look at the definition that we mentioned, or the definition of usul fiqh. Here, the qawaid, wal adilla, alati yutawassal min khilalha ila al-ilm bil ahkam al-shar'iya al-amaliya al-muktasab min adilla tiha al-tafsiriya. This definition shows you that there is no place for application and no place for creation. So here is only istimbat and juz'iyya. Istimbat and juz'iyyat. And juz'iyyat are the particular cases. So it was, this is where the sulfaq stopped. It was only a mean to come to particular cases. And it was not a mean to create, it was not a mean to apply, it was not a mean to have this broader vision on society and on uh, and, and the human being, etc. Thank you. I think we can come back to that. This question is essential. Your understanding of the school is in itself a discussion, because it's not as simple as that. So thank you for your answers. Look, uh, uh, two things. We are going to stop now. We, uh, we took from your uh, break not too long. Just uh, uh, ten minutes, but I don't know why you gave we gave you so much break. It's too long. Don't you think so? It's effectively forty-five minutes to talk about I don't know what. We might use that. Uh, it's a joke. Then okay. Uh, just one thing. We gave you uh, uh, evaluation sheets. I think you offer our people the kind you have them. So do this after the talk. Uh, if you can, it's better not to do it at the end. And we will ask you to give us, uh, to give this to us at the beginning of the afternoon session. So you take time not to give us just something that you are doing in, in, you know, very quickly. Think about what we are doing here is to help you, or to ask you to help us to doing this better. 
how to improve it. So think about this. Have this in mind in the way you are answering the question, not, oh, I have to do this because uh, I'm not going to enter this afternoon. You're not, by the way, you're not. If it's not done, you're not going to attend. But <laughs> do it. So, so the quality is for you and just the paper is for us. Okay? Thank you. So 12.30 uh, for the third session is Dr. Radin.